Um, yeah, so some of you may have heard of this initiative before. We spoke at the Coffee annual meeting, um, and you may have heard of it, what it's about. But in our experience, we've talked with people several times. It does take a little while to sink in uh, because it's not quite an academic exercise alone. It's, it's quite different for the university to be taking on something of this nature. Uh, so I'll try to walk you through it and give you some extra details than what I gave you last time. So what is animal welfare and why are we concerned? Well, we're concerned because as a society, we take care of animals, we use animals, animals are in our care and stewardship, and we really need to look after them. We know scientifically that animals do have certain cognitive abilities and they have ability to feel pain and sense emotions. So what do we do with this ethically? If we know that they're thinking and feeling, then how do we treat them? So there are a lot of different views on this, obviously. And as a society, we have to decide what do we want for animals? What standards do we want for animals? And in the last just few years, really, this has become such a big topic of importance uh, to society. And some of you may remember the live export crisis recently uh, with sheep and back in 2011 with cattle. Uh, so these are things that make news, they make um, political pressure on politicians to make swift decisions, uh, and these are things that are becoming more and more in the public conscious today. So how many of you here have heard of Moore's Law? Maybe, yeah? Um, so Moore's Law, basically, he came up with this theory that um, the processing power will double every, roughly every two years. Uh, and this means that since the start of the computer, it's been doubling. And so what is going to happen in the next few years, it's just going to keep doubling, doubling, doubling exponentially. And we're going to have more um, advanced technologies to be able to detect animal welfare. So what can we measure now? We can measure certain vital signs and things like that. Um, but we have to assume that in the near future, we're going to be able to detect things and we're going to be able to come up with gizmos that we can't even imagine. So we have to plan for that uncertainty, not knowing what we're going to be able to do, but knowing that we're going to be able to know a lot more than what we know now. And we're going to be able to know it in real time and we're going to be able to know it cheaply and efficiently. Uh, so we have to sort of plan for that explosion uh, in the next few years. So what does this mean for animal welfare? Well, this means there's going to be a lot of gadgets and gizmos come on board, and they're going to be able to do amazing things that we can't currently do. Uh, and this means that eventually, we could be looking at a scenario where every animal in Australia is on the grid. So we know what they're, what they're feeling, what sort of emotions they're experiencing, and where your food came from, and what sort of life that food had before it was food. Um, we don't know what these gadgets are going to look like at this stage. There are some on the market. Um, but we, the more important question is, what are we going to do with them? <laughs> we assume that they're going to be there and that we're going to use them, but we don't know what do we want to know from them and how are we going to use that information. Uh, so you could have a scenario where you have cattle you know, in the field and you'd say, I want to know what's going on uh, with my <coughs> cattle, especially in response to natural events. You know, are they suffering? Are they hungry? Uh, are they heat stressed? And what do I need to do to take real time management decisions for them? But we're going to have a lot of data. <laughs> we're going to have a lot of data. The, uh, as technology advances, we're going to have information coming in, and we're already seeing it happen. And the question is, what do we do with all this information? How do we analyze it? And how do we know what's important to measure and what's not important to measure? So I feel like we're getting into an era where technology is getting way ahead of where we're able to keep up. And we need to strategically think about how we're going to use that technology, especially in the area of animal welfare. So, we may be able to get numbers, we may be able to measure certain things like cortisol, for instance, which Alan has done a lot in his career, or maybe other hormones like serotonin, and be able to relate those back to what is happening with animal emotions. 
but which of these com which of these comprise welfare? Well, there's a lot of different things going on in the body, and how do we know uh, happiness and sadness and stress and fear? Those are complex emotions and physiologically complex. So on the science side, we have to decide what are we going to measure and how is that going to give us a meaningful representation of the animal's welfare at any given time. But also, we could come up with all of these tools. We could measure a lot of things. And what if the farmers really don't care? What if they don't want what we're producing? And this is really a challenge that all of science is facing right now is adoption. So we can come up with these great ideas that are going to work in the field, and we think they're going to be wonderful. And then all of a sudden, three to five years later, it falls over. And why? Because maybe they didn't really want it in the first place. And so how are we going to know what farmers want to know and what's going to help them make better decisions for the management of their animals? Well, we need to talk with them. We need to get them actively participating in the research and decision process from the very beginning. And I know that many people in Coffee are already doing this. And I think it's something that we can be really proud of as an institute. But it's not just the farmers we have to talk about. Because even if farmers think that their animals are doing great, they're ensuring the best welfare, they're not the only ones that influence their ecosystem. There's a lot of people in society, including everyone in this room, who has an opinion about animal welfare. And it's our belief that they all should be contributing in some way to defining what are the standards we're going to set. What are, when are we going to say this animal is happy enough? Uh, that is a societal and an ethical decision, and it has to be decided collectively. So we don't just need to talk to farmers. We really need to be talking to a lot of different groups in society. And just to give you an example, this is from the government of Western Australia, just about sheep production um, and sheep meat production. And so even just within the supply chain, we're talking about a lot of different actors that we need to talk to. So processors, um, sale yards, for instance. We have transporters. Transport is a big issue for welfare. All of these people need to be involved in the discussion. And importantly, we also have consumers. And so we have retailers such as Woolworths and Coles, and they're influencing how consumers see products. And they know what consumers are wanting, and they're trying to stay ahead of that curve. So they're involved with welfare discussions as well. Um, and then not shown on this diagram, if we go back to this, are people who are influencing legislation through protesting or through social media. They're putting pressure on their elected politicians to make things happen, to change regulations, to shut down industries, such as live export, for instance. And these people need to be taken into account as well. So these comprise not just animal welfare groups, not just animal rights groups, but also just community groups, people who can have a voice uh, for your average <coughs> citizen. So our attempt is to try to talk to all these people. <laughs> um, that's a lot of people, and so we've been going around Australia and meeting with different stakeholders, animal rights groups like PETA, um, RSPCA, in terms of welfare. Uh, we've been talking to all the different industries in livestock production, animal production, um, as well as the state governments, because state government has uh, legislation for animal welfare primarily. Uh, and the federal government has a role in terms of exporting uh, animal products in certain other areas. So this is a lot of different stakeholders. Our idea then is to build a stakeholder network, and this is something we've already started. So there have been stakeholder networks in the past, but we really have to think strategically about how do we make this work. And there are a few properties that we've identified that make stakeholder networks particularly effective, especially when there's all these really different views. Um, that people hold and these strong opinions. Um, so one of them is reflexivity. And we really think this is the heart of the stakeholder network, is you have to be able to appreciate that I don't agree with you, you don't agree with me, and we still are going to work together. We're not trying to get everybody to agree. Um, so that's reflexivity. It's being able to hold those multiple perspectives at once and still be able to achieve progress. 
Um, relational capital is really important. So you would be so surprised, maybe not surprised, but everything happens based on relationships. There need to be lots of opportunities to face-to-face -face interaction, which is why Alan and I have been flying around the country, meeting with people in their boardrooms and talking them through this initiative. And I really think the amount of enthusiasm we've gotten from it is because we've had these face-to-face -face discussions with people. That needs to be able to continue through this stakeholder network. We also need revitalizing. So some initiatives, you probably can think of a few, have a lot of energy in the very beginning. They have a lot of investment, say government investment. And then a few years down the line, energy wanes and things trickle away and it all falls over. We've seen this happen over and over again in research. So we need some way, when there's conflict or when there's just lack of enthusiasm, to be able to revitalize that and keep people going. We also need resilience because any day uh, there could be you know, an expose come out in the news and suddenly the whole stakeholder network is in chaos because this welfare organization posted this video. Now it's all over social media. The governments are expected to have a response. The industry is expected to have a response. We've seen this happen time and time again. So we believe there needs to be a process for this sort of conflict management in place that all the stakeholders agree to in the beginning. Let's say if there is something that hits the news, then we have a mediation process in place. And at the end of that mediation process, say eight hours together in a room, you come out and you issue a joint press release saying, we're working on and fixing these, this problem together. We recognize there's a problem and we're going to work through it together. Something like that might help to subdue these ups and downs um, in animal welfare that we see. And also responsiveness. We need to be able to give government, for instance, the responses they need. They need uh, solutions quickly. They may need advice today so that they can go out and say something on the news. So that responsiveness means you need to be able to give people answers when they need them and exactly the information they need. So these are all the things that we want to work into our stakeholder network. And this stakeholder network is called the Animal Welfare Collaborative. Uh, we've come along a long journey, and many of you have contributed to this journey, and we've developed this stakeholder network. And the next step is we're holding a conference called the Animal Welfare Summit in a week <laughs> from today um, in Sydney. And we have about 80 organizations flying in, um, all the major livestock species represented, um, academics, all the state governments, federal government, and multiple animal welfare organizations, um, as well as a few retailers and some other types of organizations. So they're all going to be discussing, OK, Let's get on the same page here. What do we want this network to look like? How do we want to finance it? Uh, what are the rules for governance? How do we make sure that one sector doesn't dominate, doesn't dominate the decisions? Because the moment that this network is thought to be bought by any particular industry or any particular actor, it loses all credibility. And then you may as well not have a stakeholder network. Um, so we really need to get this right and that's why we're asking people in this, these stakeholders to come to a summit, work through it in a day long discussions, round table discussions, and by the end of the day say, okay, this is our charter of operations, this is our strategic plan, and this is how we're gonna be financed going forward. So we have a model that we're proposing for the governance. Um, we have our management, which is the people who actually run around <laughs> doing things. Um, we'll have a CEO, we'll have subject experts. So these are the different universities. This initiative is completely university driven. Uh, UQ funded it initially, uh, but we also have the in-kind contributions of University of Western Australia, University of Newcastle and University of Adelaide. We're in discussions with University of Melbourne as well. The idea of having universities as the managers of this network is that it provides independence uh, from industry and from the other groups and from government. It provides continuity because this university has been around for a while, unlike some political parties coming in and out. 
um, and it provides that credibility of the scientific rigor behind everything we do. So we'll have an administrative council that has members of those universities on it, um, and they'll be making the strategic decisions for the collaborative, such as, you know, how are we going to operate day to day? Um, but they will be taking advice from these advisory panels that we make up, the market, which talks about market trends, production is animal production, so industries mostly, uh, community policy, and then of course science, so the scientific information base that underpins everything. And they'll be providing advice to the administrative council. And then of course we'll have every, um, all of these different members, so we will open this up to companies, for instance, can become members, uh, and I'll talk about the finance of that in a second. Uh, so doing this together, we're going to have a, a series of projects that we will take on together. These are not research projects. This is not a traditional research um, consortium. These are more focused on adoption and translation of science. Like I said before, it doesn't matter if all the research we do is really cool because if, it, if industry is not going to adopt it and community doesn't want to know it, then it doesn't matter in the first place. So we're focusing on those things, extension and adoption. And it's things that universities traditionally haven't been able to do because we have to focus on research. Um, so as a, as a collective, we're hoping we can achieve these things together. And how are we gonna finance this? <laughs> well, we have three different models we're proposing. And again, all of this is open to discussion in this upcoming summit in a week's time. One of the models is a very basic bare bones model, the communications network model. And this is based on um, the Australian Animal Welfare Strategy, which was dismantled in 2013. Uh, they ran on around a million dollars a year, and they just provided opportunities for everyone to have face-to-face -face interactions, basically, um, and to deal with conflicts together. In terms of projects that they were able to carry out, not too many. Uh, that they were able to take on on that sort of limited budget. But we could do that if that's what the people want. Um, we have a second scheme, which is called the open funding scheme, which is basically just we'll take donations from anywhere and we'll make it completely transparent. Um, again, we would, this, some people would argue this will compromise the independence of the network if you have major companies donating a lot of money we would have to put in a lot of serious governance um, measures to make sure that more money doesn't buy you more influence uh, over the collaborative's activities. But it's, it's a possibility. The other issue that I see with this middle one is, although we could do greater projects, those projects would be dependent on the funding that comes in and would vary year to year what kind of funding comes in. So we'd have to constantly be looking for new funding. The third model that we're suggesting is called the Future Fund, and some of you may know of the Medical Research Future Fund that the government has established. So the idea of this is everybody chips in money in the beginning, um, it's put into investment, nobody touches it, uh, and you operate off of the interest that you get each year. Um, so the advantages of this model is that there would be a huge initial investment, which encourages people to you know, get involved quickly, uh, but then after that, they don't have to go back to their organizations and say, give me another 5,000, give me another 10,000 each year. So one-time investment, and then this would provide enough money over time, the interest over time would grow, so the, as the organization grows, we could take on more and more projects, more and more employees, and it would just have sort of a natural growth. Um, and there would be continuity in that. We wouldn't be scared that next year we're not gonna have any funding. Uh, so this also provides opportunity for continue, continuous growth. So we're looking at about a 30 year time frame is what this strategy is hoping to achieve, the Animal Welfare Collaborative. So we're not looking, we are going to have short term projects, but they're to achieve longer term gains. And in 30 years from now, the interest will accrue and we can pass it on to other people, up and coming people who want to take over and they will have money to work with um, to be able to take on more ambitious projects uh, for animal welfare. 
So really the whole goal of this is all these activities is to place Australia as, an, as a world leader in animal welfare. And that may sound <laughs> easy, but it's not really. Um, the European Commission is doing a lot in the space of animal welfare and they're generally regarded as very high welfare standards. So even just getting up to those standards, even though the production systems are different, uh, is going to take a lot of catching up. But really to put us ahead of other countries in terms of animal welfare, we would need a very proactive and long-term strategy uh, with substantial investments and substantial changes. Uh, and this is what we are preparing everyone for. And that's it for today.